Good afternoon and good evening to our viewers from India. Under the India Island Friendship Lecture Series, our today's topic is Partition and Boundary Demarcation, a Perspective from Ireland by Professor Connor Mulwall. This topic has relevance for both India and Ireland who have seen partition as a package for freedom from, from the colonial rule. Our today's speaker, Professor Mulwag, will share his research and knowledge on this topic. Professor Mulwag is Assistant Professor in Modern Irish History at the School of History in UCD. He is also Vice Principal International for the College of Arts and Humanities. His main area of work is British and Irish political histories from 1870 to 1920 and his current research focuses on a comparative study of partitions. He has authored the book Irish Days, Indian Memories, Vivi Giri and Indian Law Students at the University College Dublin and the Irish Parliamentary Party at West Westminster. This book was awarded 2017 NEY Special Commendation Prize in Irish History. Most recently, he co-edited the book Eon McNeil, The Pen and the Sword. Before I invite Professor Mulwag to present his lecture, I would request His Excellency, the Ambassador of India, for his introductory remarks. Namaskar, a very warm welcome to all friends here and also all friends uh, in India and Ireland who are connected with this program virtually. Uh, it is a great uh, privilege for me to welcome a very dear friend you know, and uh, someone whom I have tremendous respect for, for his scholarship and his uh, erudite research work. Uh, I had great privilege of meeting him uh, some time ago and reading uh, both of his recent books. I'm very impressed uh, and uh, it is very kind of him to accept our invitation. Uh, this timing is very important for us because, as you know, we are celebrating uh, uh, 75 years of our independence, we call Ajadi Kamrit Mahotsav, and this also happens to be 100 years of Ireland's independence. So it's a very uh, historic milestone for both of us. And uh, as the ambassador of India to Ireland, I'm taking this opportunity to reassess the past linkages and history of India and uh, connect and what lessons can be learned and uh, what mistakes we have made, uh, they could have been avoided. And uh, using the past connection to build the future of India-Ireland partnership. So this is my sincere wish. And uh, uh, this, the topic that you have so kindly, graciously chosen to uh, share your knowledge with us is extremely important because uh, Ireland and India both being colonized uh, we both served as kind of crucible for experimentation by the colonial powers. So there are many things which the British, uh, based on their way, uh, several centuries of colonial exploitation of Ireland, that they developed many tools, many instrumentalities, many like, uh, policies which they perfected here and they implemented in India. Similarly, they uh, used their experience in India also to do things in Ireland. And I think partition is one uh, issue on which we both have suffered. Uh, but I think uh, uh, India probably suffered the first major blow. Uh, it was 1905. To my knowledge, that was the first time when Bengal presidency was divided uh, along ethnic, uh, along communal grounds. Uh, Muslims and Hindus, they were bifurcated. And to me, I think that was the very first time when uh, geographical territories were partitioned, were divided on such a narrow sectorial, uh, sectorian uh, religious ground. Uh, and this, and I think 1905 was very, very, very uh, significant event for Indian modern Indian history because it it actually on ground created a boundary between uh, Hindus and Muslims. And uh, Bengal used to be, in the early years of uh, 20th century, a very vibrant uh, place for nationalism, national reawakening, our history and uh, like cultural re resurgence of India. Uh, 
modern thoughts were being introduced to great poets and scholars, they were coming, and also Rahul Dushabri is inspired by uh, Alan's heroic struggle. So they were also taking roots in India. Uh, and uh, it was a very, very clever ploy to divide and rule, uh, to, to split and then, uh, but not only it very seriously damaged the nationalist movement in India, but also it created uh, minorities in one part, converting the minorities into majorities and majorities into minorities. Uh, and it's not a coincidence that in 1905 the first uh, communal partition uh, took place in India and 1906 the Muslim League is founded in uh, the eastern part of Bengal. Uh, although that partition was undone uh, in 1911, uh, but I think that may have been some kind of uh, experience of the British when they uh, used things here. And, and again, what they did here uh, in, uh, in 1919 and 1920, uh, that was again applied when we were partitioned in 1947. So your work is extremely important for India and also for Ireland. And I'm really uh, hoping that your presentation inspires a new look uh, at both 1905 developments and also 1947 developments of what actually happened and uh, what are the lessons. Uh, with these words, I extend a very warm welcome to you to share your thoughts and uh, we, we look forward to benefiting from your wisdom. Thank you. Excellency Ambassador, um, friends and guests, both joining us online and here in the room, I want to extend my heartfelt thanks to all of the Indian Embassy and to you, Your Excellency, for all your work in developing academic cultural links between Ireland and India. And by the words you've just spoken, I think it's it's proof to all who are listening to you that you have a deep understanding of the history about which you're speaking and of those important cultural connections. One of the things that I want to talk about today in exploring the history of partition predominantly in Ireland but with a view towards comparative elements and what I want to do is look at the, the processes so hopefully those of you familiar with Indian history will see similarities and those of you who are familiar with Irish history will likewise see the ramifications of policy decisions that were taken in Ireland and either learn from or as I'll speak about towards the end of this talk not learn from in terms of not learning the lessons of history. In a very short increment of time, in the 25 years between the uh, partition of Ireland and the partition of India, the same amount of time or, or thereabouts between the Good Friday Agreement and today in Irish historical terms. So this is recent lived history and yet one of the things I will focus upon in this talk is the lack of lessons learned and I'm so glad that the ambassador brought up the partition of Bengal. It will be coming up, spoiler alert, in a, a few seconds in one of my early slides. And I do think that looking at the partition of Bengal is one of the things that we need to look at in terms of a wider history of partition. Um, and while the focus of today's talk will be on the partition of Ireland, and I'm looking at a long history of partition. So not partition as a day, an event, as the 17th of August, but instead, as something that occurs with long tails going forward and backwards. And in the Irish case, I hope to show just how long the seeds of partition were laid, and then also how they will eventually um, have ramifications down to the present day. So I see partition as being one of two antagonistic tools in the policy toolkit of British or broader colonial administration in the 19th and 20th centuries. And I see six key incremental points in federation, which I see as the antonym to partition, so federation and partition. The three federations that I want to look at, and this is future research rather than anything else, so I, you, you must take what I say today with the grain of salt that this is provisional, it is exploratory, and I haven't gotten to roll my sleeves up and go to the archives and do the important work on this yet, but I see the three federations as being the federation of British North America with the Federation of Canada in 1867 with the British North America Act, then the Federation of uh, Australia with the Australian Constitution 
of 1900. And then finally, the Federation or the Union of South Africa with the uh, British Union of South Africa Act in 1909. And then the three partitions I look at with a bracketed fourth with the partition of Bengal is the partition of Ireland uh, in, let's say, 1920, 2021. And I'll say white dates don't really matter so much in a few minutes. The partition of British mandated Palestine from the mid 1930s up until 1947, 48. And then also finally the, the big partition, the partition of India, the one that sees the largest movement of people in the history of the world. Um, and also I think it's important to look at this in the context of post-conflict societies. So we have to remember that the largest mobilization of forces in uniform to have occurred in modern human history was the mobilization of sepoys in, in the, the British Army in India during the Second World War. And similarly, the partition of Ireland arises in a post-conflict settlement. So I do think that we need to think about partition as an element of the redrawing of the wider lines of society. And this is where I think the partition of Ireland and the partition of India can be seen in terms of the modern phenomenon of the nation state and where that brings us to in the present day when the nation state, I think, has had its moment in the 20th century. And we look now at larger federations and supranational entities and particularly at multicultural societies, both here in Ireland and in India, and how they present opportunities and challenges for new polities to emerge which are not based on identity or religion as the sole signifiers of citizenship within states and I think that's particularly important in modern Ireland and modern India so seeing these partitions and federations as elements of a state building process that's based off a different type of thinking about this. So today we'll mostly talk about Ireland about the processes which led to the decision on what border would be drawn on the island of Ireland. A border that has existed as an international frontier for 100 years this year, as the ambassador mentioned, um, but one which was settled upon in both its slope and its extent as early as 1914, and which was only locked in place as late as 1925. In the back of my mind, however, and as a backdrop to today's discussion, will be the partition of India and the drawing of a boundary line infinitely larger and more complex. I do not need to tell an Indian or a South Asian audience that partitions are not simple single day events. And as I said, these are things that have long tails going backwards and forwards in history, each side of the event of the cut. It's difficult to make this realization stick in the Irish case, particularly in the Irish popular imagination. And it's frequently seen that the Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1921 is the moment at which partition occurs. Yes, it's the moment in which a frontier in Ireland becomes an international frontier with Ireland remaining in the Commonwealth, or I would actually argue creating the modern Commonwealth, something that's drawn upon when we look at cabinet documents around the partition of India. They say we need to re-emphasise the importance of the Commonwealth because they realise that by losing India, they're losing the thing that makes Britain an empire because Britain really is only an empire from the dissolution of, of the uh, British East India Company and the foundation of the Empire of India in 1857. So I think also those concepts of imperialism and colonisation have a sort of a shorter legal history than they do in imagined history, particularly in the British imperial mindset. I think for both Irish and Indian audi audiences we are much more cognizant of the shorter tales uh, that, that empire and colonisation have. But the idea of Commonwealth is particularly important when we look at both of these. In terms of the Irish partition, I think it's particularly important what the ambassador said about this concept of, I would say, the emerging nation state. The idea that lines can be drawn around communities. And what we see about the Irish in India case is the fact that these communities are so intermingled that it creates both an administrative but also a policy level of difficulty when trying to do this. And this is the 1912 census of Ireland showing on a constituency level the uh, majorities and minorities for Protestant and Catholic populations being taken as a rough signifier for nationalist and unionist populations in the north. Um, and what do you do with one constituency which voted liberal and therefore excuse the, uh, the, the standard boundaries in North Rome? So this creates this inverted C shape of unionist constituencies stretching right into North Fermanagh and all along the North Antrim coast. But then it creates these problems of the two nationalist majority counties of Fermanagh and Tyrone, which are in Northern Ireland up to this day, 
and then the Catholic majority city of Derry within the Protestant majority county of County Derry. So these issues are the same issues which create issues in India, um, both in 1905 and again in 1947. And my interest in, in this is about the praxis between policy at the high level and then the realisation on the ground. So when colonial administrators draw a line of a pen and say this will work, this will create a division which will be the best acceptable division, it will keep violent factions apart, and here I'm not merely talking about India, we see this in the written documents that I'll describe in due course about Ireland and the, the dangers of potentially violent factions in the border areas of Ireland. But in reality then, what does it have except issues like this, where individual houses, and as one of my colleagues once pointed out, a dog which can't decide which side of the borderline he is standing on. So the, the idea, and again this is from a propaganda pamphlet that the Irish government put out by the, the author Frank Gallagher, uh, who was a, a key propagandist, I think that's a fair term enough for what Frank Gallagher did, but a key propagandist in Ireland, both in the 1920s and in the 1940s and 50s, when the Anti-Partition League gained probably the closest traction it could have gained towards United Ireland in the history of the 20th century. And again, this is a point of congruence between Irish and Indian history, because when I went looking for maps of the Indian partition in Irish newspapers from 1947, they're few and far between, but what we do see is Irish politicians bringing up the question that if India is to gain its independence, can we not talk about the last part of the United Kingdom? Uh, which has been calling for independence. Can we not see an end to the partition of Ireland and the reunification of Ireland? So the India partition debates in 1947 reignite the anti-partition league in Ireland among the uh, Labour Party and among Friends of Ireland and Britain and also in Irish America. So probably the one point at which there is the closest congruence of this. But I want to go back to the 1905 partition of Bengal because I do see this correctly as the ambassador mentioned as the first time in which a desire to draw boundaries around communities, uh, around intercommunal lines, and around religious lines, and taking religions as the basis for national sentiment as being pivotal to this. Um, it's, it's probably something that isn't seen or understood as much in this day and age, but Ulster was the most popular province of Ireland in the 1911 census, and Belfast was the largest city in Ireland. So the other thing that we have here is that many of the key minds of the Irish Revolution emanate from the province of Ulster and from the city of Belfast. So much in the same way that there wouldn't be an independence movement if there wasn't for a united Bengal which concerned British colonial administrators in 1905, there wouldn't be an Irish revolutionary movement if it wasn't for the minds like the subject of our latest edited collection, Owen MacNeill, who came from the Glens of Antrim and both through his history writings where he created the basis of a native Irish historiography that stripped away the mythology and gave the accurate history of medieval Ireland and told the history of an Ireland that predated the Norman Conquest, which was a massive political project. But then also his work on language revival and ultimately his, his work on physical force and the creation of an Irish volunteer movement to assert that through arms. So all these things are coming from what is seen as a province that has to be partitioned in both the Irish and Bengali case. And what we have here is an assumption among British colonial administrators that partition is the greatest way that people should be governed by, by their co-religionists and that this should be the way that people will be at their happiest. So this idea that we see of, of happy citizens and the idea that governance should be about creating happiness for those citizens. And in both the Irish and the Indian cases, we see that being then changed or altered into the process of partition. And again, in terms of learnings, what we see is very little learned from the partition and then the abandonment of the partition of Bengal. And then so quickly, literally the year after, the same British cabinet deciding on what they're going to do for the Ulster question. And we're familiar with both an India question and an Ulster question, knocking around the cabinet table, both in the early 20th century and then in the mid 20th century as issues for British administration. So with this in mind, I want to bring us back to Ireland in 1912. And this is uh, the signing of the Solemn League Covenant by Edward Carson and other members of the Ulster Unionist uh, political group, which again, we see the emergence of a distinct identity and no more than two nations theory has its resonance in Indian history, so too does it in Irish history, 
where this idea that if there was one Irish nationalism, then there was also the same claims of nationalism were equally valid within the Ulster Unionist community. And this has led historians to talk about this phenomenon of Irish history not being a, a comparison or a conflict between a great right and a great wrong, but the conflict between two great rights, between the desire for self-determination and national uh, aspirations by both the nationalist and the unionist communities, creating significant problems uh, both for colonial administrators and also for the people on the ground who found themselves geographically separated uh, from their co-religionist or their, uh, their political um, allies within this. In the Irish case, what we see in September of 1913, a year after the signing of this Solomon Covenant, is the assertion through arms or through the threat of arms uh, of this idea. So in the closing days of September 1913, a series of events occurred which jump-started discussions on the Ulster crisis following months of relative stasis. On the 24th of September, six leading unionists, led by the uh, previously pictured Edward Carson, put their name to a document proclaiming a provisional government for Ulster in the event of the province, and I quote, being forcibly subjugated to a national parliament and executive, meaning a Dublin parliament. That weekend, a rally, and this is a photograph of it, 12,000 members of the Ulster Volunteer Force was assembled outside of Belfast at the Balmoral Agricultural Showgrounds. In the wake of these two events, the launch of a provisional government and a show of strength by Ulster's rebel army, the Ulster Unionist leader, Andrew, sorry, the British Unionist leader, Andrew Bonner Law, met with Winston Churchill and told him that the Conservative Party were now open to holding a conference and that they had Carson on board. The next day, the 28th of September, at the other end of Ireland, the leader of the Home Rule movement, John Redmond, visited his ancestor, sorry, the ancestral home of the nationalist hero Daniel O'Connell, and en route he gave a firm statement of the Irish Home Rule Party's position on the Ulster question. He unambiguously rejected the idea that Ulster could be excluded from any Irish Home Rule settlement, and Redmond managed to stoke rather than ease tensions when he told his audience that, and I quote, the whole agitation in Ulster is but a gigantic and preposterous absurdity. So again, we see this confluence of Irish and Indian history with the challenge of two national assertions competing with each other, and then the other side um, either taking seriously or not taking seriously the demand of the other side. Irish nationalism was at this point dominated by the Irish Parliamentary Party, a pledge-bound party with elected MPs who consisted approximately three quarters of Ireland's seats at the House of Commons. Around the chairman, John Redmond, were another three MPs who were his closest advisers and allies. John Dillon was the MP for Mayo East and the former leader of the majority faction of the Irish nationalist movement during the 1890s. T.P. O'Connor was the Irish party's only MP to sit for a British constituency, showing the strength of the Irish diaspora, and he was consistently elected in the city of Liverpool, uh, right up until after independence, his death in 1929. The fourth and youngest member of this inner circle was Joseph Devlin, and in the context of partition, Devlin is particularly significant. He was secretary of the United Irish League, he was president of the Ancient Order of Barbarians, but most importantly, he was the MP uh, and powerhouse of West Belfast, the Catholic enclave in an otherwise Protestant majority city. T.P. O'Connor played an important role during the Home Rule crisis. As a London resident, almost permanently, O'Connor was close to the leading members of the Liberal political establishment, particularly David Lloyd George. And on the 30th of September 1913, at the request of Prime Minister Herbert Henry Asquith, Lloyd George sent for T.P. O'Connor and sought to ascertain his outlook of the Irish party on the recent developments in Ulster. Immediately after a meeting, O'Connor wrote to John Dillon explaining how, and I quote, Lloyd George certainly sees all the difficulties of our assenting to the exclusion of Ulster, and it's evident to me that the Tory party as a whole is somewhat alarmed by the position of Carson and would grasp at any compromise that would save their faces. O'Connor found that Dillon was away, so the following day he wrote to Joseph Devlin, explaining how, and I quote, Lloyd George has proposed at the beginning of the struggle that Ulster should uh, get the option of a plebiscite, feeling confident that it would be refuted and refused, uh, but he still thought that it would be wise tactics. We have discussed calmly and amicably our difficulty in, to agree into a proposal 
which would look like a betrayal of our fellow nationalists in Ulster. So this is the idea that's openly being discussed among three of the four leaders of the Irish Parliamentary Party, that there would be a plebiscite in Ulster, that there would be a temporary exclusion, and the one person that's being left out of the discussion is the MP for West Belfast, the leader of Ulster nationalists, Joseph Devlin. Devlin, Dillon and Redmond all passionately felt that the absolute necessity would be that no consideration should be given to concessions on Ulster, and the rights of nationalists in all four provinces should be defended at all costs. By contrast, T.P. O'Connor had now revealed that he was willing to throw a still undetermined portion of Ulster open to plebiscite, and this is in 1913. Having found the Irish party intransigent, the government was now forced to give some level of recognition to the growing potential for trouble in Ulster. It should be remembered that this occurred on, uh, before the 25th of November 1913, when the pro-home rule Irish Volunteer Force was founded, and ultimately the Irish uh, Republican Army very much modelled, or let's say, became the model uh, for the Indian National Army and the Indian uh, Republican Army in the 1940s. So at this point, the paramilitary forces facing each other, the Ulster Volunteers and the Irish Volunteers, meant that there was a growing chance of violence and disorder and what we might call intercommunal tension in Ireland, with the focus being on the city of Belfast. On the 13th of November 1913, Herbert Henry Asquith wrote to Redmond requesting a meeting and explaining that he was anxious to have a talk with you. I feel that your speech in Newcastle will be uh, careful to show that there will be a possibility of an agreed settlement. I will only add for the moment that I am by no means sanguine that anything of this kind can happen, nor need I assure you of the firm and unshaken determination of my colleagues and myself to attain your help of this common object. On the 17th of November 1913, two key meetings were held at Downing Street. In the morning, the Prime Minister met with Redmond, and in the afternoon, Lloyd George met with John Dillon, along with Percy Illingworth, the Chief Whip of the Liberal Party, in attendance. In his meeting with the Prime Minister, Redmond discussed uh, the, the situation with Bonner Law, and Asquith then discussed Ulster in frank terms with Redmond. He expressed a concern that was shared with Cabinet, and was then necessary to look towards some settlement which would avoid bloodshed in Ulster. So they were cognizant of this in the winter of 1913. Asquith warned Redmond that, and I quote, the Carsonites are in possession of at least 5,000 rifles, probably more, and his information from the War Office regarding the attitude of the army was of a very serious character, pointing to the probability of very numerous resignations of commissions of officers in the event of troops being used to put down an Ulster insurrection. So this is before the First World War, before any discussion of partition was particularly public, and now we're seeing things that will come to pass in 1914. The uh, lack of ability to count on the army, and also the idea of uh, 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 importation of arms and ammunition into Ulster. In a meeting later that afternoon, and this is uh, Mr. Devlin, sorry, this is uh, Dylan's uh, memorandum of his meeting with Lloyd George, um, it was also noted that 9,500 rounds of ammunition had been intercepted while being attempted to be imported into Ulster. Following this, the last uh, link in the chain by the spring of 1914 was to bring Joseph Devlin on side. And in a memorandum on the 20th of February, Devlin finally conceded that some degree of compromise would have to be done. And here he agreed to a strictly time-limited inclusion or exclusion of Ulster from the Home Rule Settlement. So this official shift by March of 1914 um, would signal the Irish party's willingness to sacrifice some degree of, um, of the nationalists within the, the northeast of Ireland in Ulster in order to ensure that Home Rule would be gained for the whole island in the long term. This leads us to a situation where there was, I suppose, two, two um, armed and not yet fighting factions in Ireland willing to either support or uh, deny Home Rule at a future point. And this leads us to the powder keg of 1914. The official shift in the Irish policy would come later, um, but this was a situation where Ireland had to find itself in a situation where somebody would have to compromise on the question of partition. The government now quietly began to make contingency plans by drawing up the area in which exclusion might apply. And this was the next phase in which the modern Irish border began to take shape and was first put on paper. 
Despite his promise that it would be their last word, Lloyd George extracted further concessions in the weeks that followed. Three year time limits would be pushed out to six years and a revised white paper was made public when Asquith moved a second reading of the Home Rule Bill on the 9th of March 1914. As per Lloyd George's plan, it was proposed that on petition and on a county by county basis, Ulster counties would be allowed to exclude themselves from the operation of the proposed Home Rule Bill for an as yet to be determined number of years. Exactly a month later, on the 6th of April 1914, a new set of proposals was circulated to Cabinet. One of the most significant alterations between the March and April proposals was that the six excluded counties were to be included in the Irish unit of self-government unless by their own consent. The government persisted for over two years in claiming that the Irish party leadership proposals for exclusion were strictly time limited. However, this document showed that from April 1914 onwards, the British government had agreed to the principle that no move would be made to coerce or impose the reunification of Ireland on its supposedly temporary partition. Given the absolute majority of Protestants, which roughly but not entirely mapped onto Unionism as a political construct, the possibility of any permutation of Ulster territory opting by ballot for an inclusion in a home rule of Ireland after the period of exclusion had elapsed was remote in the extreme. Although the Lloyd George scheme was predicated on the principle of four county exclusion, the lines of demarcation alluded to in the settlement um, were still very much up in the, in the air in the period from March to July of 1914. At the Irish office, Chief Secretary for Ireland, Augustine Birrell, began requesting information for proposals for a boundary line for the excluded area uh, to be uh, simultaneously with the printing of the government's white paper. Birrell drew upon his expertise of three senior civil servants to help to determine the best shape for an exclusion zone for the portion of Ulster that would be excluded from a home rail Ireland. These were Birrell's undersecretary, Sir James B. Doherty, W.F. Bailey, the Estates Commissioner's Office Head, and Sir Henry Augustus Robinson, the Vice President of the Irish Local Government Board. Birrell set the 6th of May 1914 as the deadline for receipt for proposals from his three advisors. The first scheme that I want to take here, these are just some of the maps that were, were going through the, uh, the, the, um, the Irish office at the time, to try and look at poor law unions, to look at um, constituency seats, county options, and the various breakdowns of the population and what they would look like in terms of uh, a breakdown of a partition of Ireland. Uh, and remember at all times, this is an administrative partition between two parts that would remain within the United Kingdom but would have devolved governments. So this is the key thing, that the partition discussions are around a United Kingdom that would have devolved rule but no independence. But we find that this partition evolves into one that later leads us to a uh, permanent partition up to the present day. So the first one is this scheme, which uh, is a written scheme from W.F. Bailey. So his maps have become separated from their accompanying correspondence in the years since. And these can be found um, in the, the Bodleian Library in Oxford today. However, it's possible to reconstruct from his description and tables the boundaries of his excluded area that he proposed. Of the three, the Bailey scheme was the most disruptive and paid little heed to existing admi administrative boundaries. Instead, Bailey relied on physical geography to craft a more visible border. In the county of Fermanagh, in the west of modern-day Northern Ireland, Bailey cut straight through the county's parliamentary divisions and ran his boundary line directly up the middle of the urn waterway system. Of the three schemes, Bailey's was the only in which the accompanying notes made no acknowledgement of the scheme's temporary nature. Thus, while nationalists were still working under the premise that they had consented to temporary exclusion, at least one official was drawing two clearly identifiable and separate, separate regions in West Ulster's waterways to create a solid and discernible line of geographical and physical separation. The Bailey scheme was the most rushed of the three and it included some quite questionable calls. Bailey proposed the inclusion of the entire parliamentary division of North Monaghan within the Unionist area. Monaghan was the county that nobody else ever considered in their permutations and a portion Bailey had chalked out for exclusion had a two-thirds Catholic majority, but he still decided to put it on the quote-unquote unionist side of the line. Because his boundary line sliced through existing administrative units, it was impossible for Bailey to accurately estimate 
how many of the almost 1.2 million people, and I know that's a figure that's risibly small in Indian terms when we talk about your partition, but uh, the 1.2 million people that he planned to exclude from the jurisdiction of a Home Rule Parliament, how many of them were Catholics and Protestants? So what I've done with this is I've taken Bailey's memorandum and the accompanying notes, and in the summer of 2018, I drew this line, uh, taking it and literally in PowerPoint with my red line. So you'll have to excuse its roughness, but I follow the urn waterway, I take in the, the part of Monaghan that Bailey indicates where it will go in. And I started on the east there, uh, in the southeast, and I worked my way along, township by township, almost zooming in and layering multiple maps over each other to draw this line and reconstruct from this piece of paper and its accompanying appendices, this line. So this is the closest approximation you can get to the Bailey scheme. And as I said there, it makes some very interesting calls. The next scheme that I, I want to look at is the scheme of Henry Augustus Robinson. Um, this is the memorandum, but I think what you'll be more interested in is the map. So this is a map that Robinson submitted uh, to the Chief Secretary's office in Ireland. Um, and the reason I know that it's his map, apart from that it tallies with my rights, is that it has Sir HR at the top of it. So I think we can make a relatively educated guess. I've zoomed in on the northern part of the map. Obviously it comes as an all-island map. And it's key here that Robinson had actually drawn the local government boundaries in Ireland for the 1898 Local Government Act. So he was quite proud of the boundaries he had drawn in 1898. And ultimately he relies on these boundaries. So the administrative divisions for local government as the basis of the lines that he uses to draw his boundary line. I won't say partition, but his boundary line in May of 1914. By far the most thorough of the three exclusion schemes that was devised was that by Robinson. In drawing his boundary line, Robinson took local government boundaries of the operational unit, as I said, and the Under Secretary would later dismiss this method as unworkable. The Robinson scheme proposed the exclusion of 1,178,000 persons from the operation of the Home Rule Act. This amounted to 26.85% of the population of Ireland and at £4,545,000. 28.5% of Ireland's land by valuation. And again, as someone who is interested in local government, land valuation was a factor that Robinson brought into his calculations. Of the three schemes, Robinson's boundary line was the only one that explicitly considered infrastructural factors, such as road and rail connections. Even though Robinson's line was not ultimately adopted, his justifications are highly instructive in explaining the policy of thinking underpinning the final shape of the Irish border. This is especially true of the two Catholic majority counties of Fermanagh and Tyrone and of the majority Catholic city of Derry. On the eastern end of Robinson's boundary line, I don't know if there's a laser on this, yeah, but around there in Downpatrick and County Down, um, the Robinson scheme showed considerably more sympathy for Catholics than simple six county exclusion, which is what we ultimately ended up with. The Robinson scheme left uh, Armagh and South Down, including the heavily Catholic town of Newry within Irish Home Rule jurisdiction. By contrast, in the western half of Ulster, Robinson made a number of sweeping decisions that excluded large swathes of territory with solid Catholic majority from the jurisdiction of Home Rule. Arguably the most interesting variable which Robert Robinson considered in drawing his line was, and I quote, the degrees of obstreperousness in the rival sectarian factions on the borderline. In terms of appeasing volatile sectarian communities, Robinson bent to both nationalist and unionist extremists. Of cross McGlenn nationalists, he said, they are about the warmest lot I know. And in Fermanagh, Robinson's justification was even more illuminating. Here he justified the exclusion of an area with a 3,000 strong Catholic majority because, and I quote, there has been more money spent on armament and drilling here than in any part of the county. These Enniskillen and Lisnesky Protestant farmers are the most bloodthirsty set of ruffians I know. Robinson's word, not mine. Uh, fearing a contagion effect into County Cavan and Monaghan, Robinson defended the exclusion of these districts as, and I quote, there are many, uh, sorry, there would be no peace of settlement along the whole borderline if these people were left out. Bailey had applied the same logic in justifying the inclusion of North Monaghan and the whole of Tyrone, the Protestant majorities of which he described in Mrs Bailey's words as being very strong and better drilled and armed 
than almost any part of the province. So here we see British administrators bending to the perceived threat of armed insurrection or intercommunal violence in the border areas. So not a single shot is being fired in any of these districts, but they're looking at police reports, they're looking at the amount of armament, the amount of drilling, um, and the general threat level that exists, and they're saying the path of least resistance is to draw the border not where the majorities exist, but around the minorities that are most dangerous. So the appeasement of small but well-armed minorities ended up shaping um, the, the ultimate boundary line that Robinson, not the one that was adopted, but the one that Robinson favoured. Now, where I do this, bring this into the, the modern border, is that the majority counties of Fermanagh and Tyrone were ultimately included, despite having overwhelmingly Catholic, and therefore we infer nationalist, majorities. And the same logic appears to apply, although it's written down in both the case of Bailey and Robinson's scheme, not so in the more blunt instrument of county option. Despite all his careful work and calculations, Robinson virtually cast aside everything towards the end of his letter when he wrote to Berlin's death and said, I expect that you will find the Ulster men's minimum will be in six entire counties and in a no option. Personally, I agree about no option, i.e. putting the matter to a plebiscite, but it will indeed mean riots when the crucial issue is announced. So those same fears of intercommunal violence that we see in the fear of Indian partition being enunciated by senior uh, administrators in, uh, in Ireland and Dublin Castle. Uh, the Doherty scheme then, the third scheme, this is ultimately, uh, this is the paperwork that, that comes from it in the Viral paper, so he's the Chief Secretary and that's where they ended up, and this is Under Secretary writing to Chief Secretary in May of 1914. And there's no picture of this, but it's the same borders today, so this is the picture of the modern border. Um, of the three advisors, the most reluctant to, uh, was his second command. James Brown Doherty, the Under Secretary for Ireland. While Bailey and Robinson replied with detailed, even enthusiastic suggestions on the 6th, which was the deadline, Doherty replied on the 7th, making apologies that prior engagements had delayed him with ultimately drawing the border that would last for 100 years and counting on the island of Ireland. So it's interesting to think again when we talk about the Radcliffe line, the amount of care and precision that's put into these versus human factors and sometimes just the rush that massive decisions are made with. Um, and and uh, he said it was difficult, if not impossible, job to construct these pens. And the, it's interesting he uses this agricultural term, the pens, to describe the caging in of the two communities. Um, the policy of exclusion, whether the plan be adopted, bristles with difficulties. And at the moment, I confess, I do not see how they could be surmounted. Doherty provided his full memorandum five days later on the 11th of May. So his 7th of May letter was really, I'm sorry I'm late, I'm still working on it. And then a week later, he actually sends in his document. And here he says um, that uh, of, of these, the, the Doherty scheme was the one that was ultimately adopted. And his rationale focused largely on uh, county option and the administrative headache he foresaw in dealing with uh, otherwise excluded areas like local government boards, county councils, the existence of parliamentary constituencies, which would need to be split across two jurisdictions. All three schemes recommended that Ulster's second city, Derry, with a Catholic majority, as I've mentioned several times, would be put into the Unionist exclusion zone. Robinson argued that it would be, and I quote, impossible to keep the maiden city of the parent county, and Doherty reminded his chief secretary that, and Doherty was a native of County Derry, not the city, he said the city of Derry has a strong sentimental attraction for Ulster Protestants, and it is the headquarter of the county administration. Adding that, and I quote, it is unlikely that the Covenanters, i.e. the Unionists, will now consent to see the city excluded from Protestant Ulster. So again, working around paths of resistance. Doherty, as a native of Garba, on the other side of the county, um, saw that the Catholic enclave constituency of West Belfast and Derry seemed to have been the cases that convinced him of the merits of whole county plebiscites or whole county option over constituency options. By having Derry's county and city constituencies vote as a single unit, Derry City's 56% Catholic majority would be negated, with a, rel a reliable 54% overall Protestant majority in the county. The full county looks certain to vote itself out of home rule, including its maiden city. So again, this is about manufacturing majorities and minorities to suit the outcome that they want. And I suppose one of the contrasts here is that the partition of Ireland 
does create a contiguous line with one very small enclave. Um, and I know that, I was looking at the recent history of this, that um, the 2015 settlement between the borders of Bangladesh and India have ended some of the enclaves within enclaves that existed along the border. But even in the 1947 example, it's obviously a chaotic border on, on both sides, east and west, in the partition um, of colonial India. So I think here we're looking at something that's a little bit more contiguous and straightforward. But this is a consideration that's, that's considered that if they went below county option, they would have enclaves in Belfast and enclaves in Derry that would leave a patchwork of constituencies and all the administrators say, administratively and otherwise, this is something we don't want. So we want a clean line rather than anything else. If the Derry question could be solved by simple county option, the same logic did not settle the question of what to do with the Catholic majority counties of Fermanagh and Tyrone. With a combined Catholic majority of 64%, the decision over these two counties would impact upon an additional 204,000 Catholics for the sake of 113,000 Protestants. And again, all the figures I'm quoting here are determined from the 1911 census, and it was in these religious terms that the administrators worked because that, that was the designation they had from the census. Nobody was asked, do you, do you identify as unionist or nationalist? But they were asked their religion, so they're taking this as an administrative proxy. Despite declaring whole county option, Doherty fudged his answer as to the question of whether it would be four or six counties to be excluded. His rationale for four county exclusion was based on the fact that such a scheme would create a tolerably compact area, in his words. But it seems on balance that he conceded that six counties would be a more realistic outcome due to the fact that it is difficult to see how the Ulster Covenanters in the four counties would abandon their brethren in Fermanagh and Tyrone, his quote. He doesn't mention at all that the other three counties um, of Calvin, Monaghan and Donegal, which had been included in the Ulster Covenant in 1912, were now being quietly abandoned in 1914. In light of the above, following the Nationalist leadership's accession to the principle of a strictly time-limited exclusion in March, Dublin Castle now favoured full six-county exclusion. Despite the strong preference in Dublin for full county exclusion, it has been suggested that other permutations were not entirely cast aside. The historian, the late historian, unfortunately, Brendan O'Donoghue, who was the first to write about Robinson's scheme, makes a convincing case that copies of the various maps that I've shown you here, but not this one, but the other previous maps, um, were brought to the Buckingham Palace Conference in July of 1914, when it came to discussing permutations for an area of exclusion that might be acceptable to both unionists and nationalists. So, I want to go on, this, this is, I suppose, probably a little bit dense to go into in detail, but I have crunched the numbers on this of the various schemes, so the Bailey scheme, the Robinson scheme, the Doherty scheme, four county exclusion, the ultimate six county exclusion, which is the same as the Doherty scheme, the rest of Ireland, the province of Ulster, the other three provinces, and Ireland as a whole. So you can see there the population area in the 1911 census, um, the number of Catholics, and the number of non-Catholics, breaking down all the different non-Catholic groups um, within the island at the time. So this shows you that the ultimate six county scheme uh, would bring um, 1.2 million or 1.25 million people into the excluded area of Ulster, and that would have 34.4% Catholics and 65.6% uh, Protestants. So that's ultimately the borderline that's accepted. And as I said there, the Robinson scheme is that little bit more sympathetic. Um, and so similarly, we can't tell with the Bailey scheme because it was so rushed. So where does this leave us in terms of a border that is decided upon in 1914? So in 1916, after the 1916 rising, Lloyd George, now the Minister for Munitions and soon to be the Prime Minister of Great Britain and Ireland, uh, decides, or not decides, he asked by Herbert Henry Asquith, will he preside over negotiations around the Ulster question? And in the prelude to this, Joseph Devlin, who you met earlier in the talk, convenes a convention of all the nationalists of the proposed six counties to be excluded. And in a Herculean speech, he implores them to vote themselves in a strictly time-limited basis out of home rule and into partition to save the prospect of home rule for the rest of Ireland. Now, similarly, Lord George, in a feat of speaking to different constituencies with different promises that he will replicate with the 1921 treaty, and in other um, moments, he gives uh, more firm assurances to unionists that this will not be a temporary partition, it will indeed be a permanent partition. 
And you can see here, after Devlin's speech, the vote of nationalists in Northern Ireland, or their delegates in the United Irish League, uh, vote 475 to 265 in favour of excluding themselves from, uh, from a home rule of Ireland. So this is a seismic moment where nationalists are voting for their own self-exclusion and voting for partition as a pragmatic move to try and ensure unity and particularly peace and an avoidance of bloodshed on the island of Ireland at a later date. Um, and this is again the six county um, idea that, that they look at. So I wanna, rather than getting bogged down in things, I want to catapult a little bit forward to the Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1921. And in the treaty, Article 12, I think is one of the most significant, well, certainly in terms of, of partition it is, but also in terms of the, the mode of creating, I suppose, a delay on the largest issue that Lloyd George faced in negotiating the Irish question. So here you can see that a commission consisting of three persons, one to be appointed by the government of the Irish Free State, one to be appointed by the government of Northern Ireland, and one who shall be chairman to be appointed by the British government shall determine and this is the key bit, in accordance with the wishes of the inhabitants, so far as they may be compatible with economic and geographic conditions, so that's an interesting caveat there, the boundaries between Northern Ireland and the rest of Ireland. So this will become the Irish Free State. So this is interesting. If you think about how the rest of the Wilsonian democracies in this Paris Peace Treaty's moment in the early 1920s are being determined in the Rhineland, uh, in southern Poland, in the former borders of the German Empire, plebiscites are happening. And plebiscites are further defeated. But here we don't have plebiscites. This is a commission, exactly like in India. So the colonised peoples of the British Empire, whether they be Irish or Indian, they don't get to vote on their futures. Instead, their futures are determined by a quasi-judicial commission. And you know that we have the two boundary commissions in 1947 for both the eastern and western boundaries. Um, of, of the partition of India. So the exact same mechanism you'll see here in the Irish case. And the key thing here is this takes the partition question out of the, be the debates on the Anglo-Irish Treaty in 1921 and 1922. The historian Maureen Wall showed that only nine columns, or sorry, nine pages of the hundreds of pages of debates on the Anglo-Irish Treaty mentioned the question of, of Ulster and partition at all. And most of these were contributed by three TDs from County Monaghan, which obviously was one of the, the core pivot counties on the border, and finds itself kind of bulging into modern day Northern Ireland. So this becomes the pivotal issue, but by kicking it forward, it means that it isn't an issue in the Irish Civil War, it isn't an issue in the creation of the Irish Free State, and instead, those ideas of independence revolve around sovereignty, symbols, and statehood, rather than around the question of partition and plebiscites and things like that. So this idea of delay is particularly effective as a British government tool for delaying partition. However, in contrasting this with the modern history of India, I will say that one of the things, uh, either a, a, I suppose a, an intended or unintended benefit of this policy is that people are waiting for the border to come to them. They feel that, okay, there's an Irish free state now, there's the state of Northern Ireland, and whether you're a Protestant living in North Monaghan or a Catholic living in South Armagh, you're waiting for the border to move. You're not finding yourself having to get to the nearest train station to move to the jurisdiction that aligns with your own political or religious beliefs. So there's, there's no urgency to this, and people sit tight and stay put in order to wait for partition to come to them. Um, so this is the type of propaganda then that Ireland's, so the Irish Free States and Northeastern Boundary Bureau put out in 1923. This is a map, and just to zoom in on part of it, showing the economic hinterlands of the various towns and cities along the border. And the intention here by the Irish government of this department, which is created to produce positive propaganda about ending partition, and also to try and provide statistics to Owen McNeil on the Irish Boundary Commission as a commissioner, that these are the kind of things, the reasons why the border shouldn't exist. Because a town like Enniskillen reaches right down into County Sligo in terms of its economic hinterland. So these kind of considerations are now playing into it. And it's interesting that this copy of the Handbook of the Ulster Question, which looks like a kind of empirical fact book, is produced by the Northeastern Boundary Bureau as a piece of propaganda. And the copy that I consulted was in the Deutsches Historischen Museum in Berlin. Because what the Irish government does, it distributes this to the new republics of the, of the post-First World War world to try and gain international recognition 
for the fact that the border shouldn't exist. So it's a very interesting feat in propaganda, which is replicated in the 1940s when Indian partition makes uh, the anti-partition league in Ireland again see the, the possibility of this. So finally in 1924, and this is a photograph of the first day of their, their tour of Armagh, the 9th of December 1924. These are the three boundary commissioners. I don't know if that, that laser doesn't hit the TV screen, but Owen McNeill on the extreme right. Uh, then we have J.R. Fisher beside him, sorry. Um, and on the, the other extreme of the photo is the, uh, the ultimate chairman of the boundary commission, um, uh, Justice Feedham, the South African judge, who was brought in as a neutral party. So it's interesting that these boundary commissioners tour the border and they interview local inhabitants. Frequently the people they're interviewing are the power brokers in the local community. So priests, religious representatives, business and industry representatives, and all of the kind of great and the good. And they really do focus in on this question of in line with economic and geographic conditions. There's actually a geologist and geographer, Major Boger of the British Army, who accompanies the Boundary Commission to advise them on the geographic um, and even geological, as, as we understand it, conditions that would mean the border should sit on a certain uh, point or not. And here we really have to ask ourselves questions about whether or not um, Owen McNeill really understood his remit here, because J.R. Fisher, the Northern representative, is constantly leaking information from the Boundary Commission back to the Northern Irish government. But McNeill, as a student of law, as I've argued in the most recent uh, book we published on Owen McNeill, I argued that McNeill saw his role as quasi-judicial because he studied law. So he sees this binding to secrecy and also the role he's playing as being a judicial rather than a political one. So he maintains the secrecy and finally, when the report of the Irish Boundary Commission is leaked to the Conservative London newspaper, The Morning Post, uh, a year later in November of 1925, the cabinet in Dublin is aghast because McNeill has never briefed them on what's going to happen in this. And the shock for Ireland, for the Irish Free State, is that small portions of the Irish Free State will actually be handed over to Northern Ireland as a border exchange. And this idea that parts of the Irish Free State would now go back into um, the British Empire and the United Kingdom um, it is so shocking that the Irish government eventually does a, a settlement on this and locks the border in. So the border that Doherty proposes in 1940, the six county blunt instrument border, is locked in after this slight sympathetic moving of small little pieces back and forth that would see a more sympathetic border on the island of Ireland. Um, and we would argue would probably have led to uh, a different Northern Irish troubles in the 1970s, but particularly uh, in the border around Armagh and then also the border uh, around Fermanagh and Leitrim. So having reviewed the origins of the boundary line eventually adopted in Ireland, some comparisons with Indian partition are warranted. One of the most striking contrasts in the partition of Ireland and India are the timelines involved. The second is the finality of the settlement at the point of announcement. Irish partition was a policy that trickled out over an 11 year period from 1914 to this, the collapse of the Boundary Commission in 1925. At the point when the boundary between Northern Ireland and the Irish Free State became an international frontier in 1922, the decision to determine a more sympathetic border via the work of this Boundary Commission meant that people living along the border could stay in the hope that the border itself would move and they wouldn't have to. Teachers in border areas of Northern Ireland continue to be paid by the new Dublin Provisional Administration in 1922 in the expectation that these schools and their districts would soon be governed by Dublin as the border would be redrawn in accordance with those wishes of the inhabitants and that this would be contiguous with the geographic and economic conditions as stipulated in Article 12 of the Treaty. While the relative docility of events on the border would be little solace to the inhabitants of Belfast where 498 deaths occurred between July of 1920 and October of 1922. The, these deaths can be broken down as 37 ground forces, 29 members of the IRA and FINA Erin, and as always in the case of these types of violences, 181 Protestant civilians and 254 Catholic civilians who were killed in these riots, workplace displacements, um, and, and uh, the, the burning of houses across Catholic areas. Of, uh, of Belfast in 1920-22. However, even on a per capita basis, this does not equate to the scale of intercommunal violence witnessed in the partition of India. Likewise, the scale of displacement from refugees is incomparable. 
If provisionality of the borderline itself is one factor that can be seen to account for the contrast in experiences between the partition of Ireland and India, then the second is the timelines that I alluded to. The frenzy of the announcement of the Radcliffe Line in August of 1947 contributed greatly to the ways in which partition played out. There was no 17th of August moment in Ireland. Instead, on April Fool's Day, 1923, uh, and I want to show you this photo here, on April Fool's Day of 1923, the first visible identifiers of a boundary line which had theoretically existed since the establishment of Northern Ireland in June of 1921 came into being when the Irish Free State, not Northern Ireland, decided to erect customs posts along the border's main crossings. These customs posts were the first piece of visible border infrastructure on a line that would later, through war and terror, become the most militarised of Europe's borders west of Germany in the early 1970s. Today, peace walls in the city of Belfast make it the only city in post-Cold War Europe to still have an active partition architecture functioning at the heart of its divided communities. So unfortunately, in the case of Ireland, as in the case of India, the, um, here I've taken a, a photograph of, of the uh, border crossing of Wagga from uh, 2014. I haven't been to this border myself, but it's an interesting contrast to contrast that type of border to the invisible border in the, the rural aspects of Ireland. So this is the view from the village of Pedigal, looking from the Republic of Ireland over that small bridge where that car is crossing into Northern Ireland. And uh, you can pass through this border seamlessly to this day. However, I do think that in the case of Belfast, it's interesting to see that urban partitions between communities are the ones that are still functioning as lines of demarcation, on lines of identity in modern Ireland. So it's interesting to see how this was the seamlessness of, of one border in rural areas that has been under threat from Brexit, but then the difficulty in community relations leading to these kinds of structures in modern Northern Ireland. So these leave open questions of borders that I think are ones that it behoves any scholars of geography, of history, of sociology and of politics uh, in Ireland and in India to think about the commonalities of our shared paths into independence and out of, of colonial rule, but also how these have shaped our geographies to the modern day and what that means for both our bilateral relations with our neighbours, but also our relations within our own countries ourselves. So thank you very much for listening today. I hope that's provided some interest and thank you for your